Living in Israel in time of war is hard for just about anybody. With all the social dynamics, all the religious issues, the politics of it all, the economy. But if you're an illegal, it makes it so much worse. So today I'll tell you a story about a small community of Christians that migrated from Egypt to Israel in search of work. I told the story about the hospital and the eye surgery program that the organization supports. I met a lot of interesting people through that hospital, mostly from Palestine, but there were a couple from Egypt. And as I got to know them, they told me their stories. I interviewed them and actually spent some time with them because I thought it was really interesting. Here's the story, and it's repeated. That it's a small community. There's maybe 150 to 200 of them. These are Egyptians that are part of the Coptic Church. Coptic is an ancient language. Um, they have their prayer books in Coptic, and then a translation of those texts into Arabic. They all speak Arabic. They come from small cities, most of them, not even cities, towns in, um, in Egypt where there's very little work. Um, I heard some crazy stories about a guy doing manual labor, getting injured on the job site and then not being able to work. And in Egypt, there's no options for him left as far as work. So he gets a special permit to come visit Israel as part of a tour to visit the holy sites because he's a Christian and he wants to see biblical sites. Except that his plan is to skip the tour and go find a place to live and find a job and stay here illegally because he only gets a couple of weeks, maybe a month of, of a permit visa to be in Israel and then he's supposed to return, but he skips out. So there's a community of a hundred or more of stories like this. And all of these guys are probably 40s, 50s, I met some even 60-year-olds. Uh, and they work in manual labor, they clean the streets and they, they work for the, for the city. Um, it's funny, right? They work for the city, but they're illegal. A lot of that kind of manual work, construction, cleaning, and all that kind of stuff in Israel mostly gets done by contractors. Uh, so they kind of hire their own people. The city has an agreement with the contractor, so they don't really know about who's working there. And the contractor sometimes will take the risk of hiring illegals because it's, it's a better deal for him. Um, obviously, the working conditions are pretty miserable. They, get no, they only get paid by the day. You miss a day, you don't work. You miss a few days, you might get fired. So at any point, if, you get, if you're sick or if you're injured or something, you still make it to work. Not only are the working conditions difficult, the living conditions are pretty terrible. Most of them work for only about 100 shekels, like $30 a day, so they can't afford their own place. Um, rent in Israel is pretty expensive. Even like in, in the worst neighborhood, you're paying uh, at least $400, I think. So if you're making $300 a month, there's no way you can afford any kind of normal place. So what they do is they come together. They all live in the same area. They all go to the same church. The only, I guess there's only a few uh, Coptic churches in the whole country. And they all settle right there where one of them is. It's an Arab neighborhood. They find uh, the cheapest apartment possible. So it's going to be old. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be in some kind of basement. It's going to be small, probably just a one bedroom. And there's like eight of them living in a one bedroom. So the first one I met at the hospital he is like 60 years old. He's getting surgery on one of his eyes because he started losing eyesight. And he works, he cleans the streets for, for the city. So... He's supposed to come in for the surgery, but he can't even get there because he comes from like a, such a small town and he is kind of older and he doesn't know his way around, even though he, he can speak the same language. I mean, he can get by with Arabic anywhere in the country, but it's a long bus ride to Jerusalem from where he lives. And then in Jerusalem, you kind of have to find your way around. And if you're older, if you can't see very well, and if you have no money, then it's a problem. So I end up driving him to the hospital. I'll go and pick him up. Um, try to find them, try to communicate with them. We have a guy on the phone that's translating for the both of us. The guy is so, I was really shocked. The guy gets in the car, in the, in the passenger seat, and the car is, starts beeping because he, he needs to put his seatbelt on. So I'm like, hey, I motioned him, hey, can you put the seatbelt on? He grabs it and... <laughs> I love this guy. He doesn't know what to do with the seat belt. He's all like, he's all like trying to put it on around his, his shoulder, his head. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I show him how to do it. Uh, I uh, buckle him up. So that's the kind of, just a simple man from some small, small village. Never put a seat belt on in his life. Probably because 
there's no other cars around. I mean, I'm sure they have cars. This is the first one I met. So because I had to take him from his house when I took him back, he's like, hey, come in, come in. He invited me for coffee. So I sit there. Obviously, when I interviewed him, there was a translator. So I knew what his story is. And, and he was staying on the couch at his friend's place, friends, like seven other friends living in this apartment. They invited him to stay there because he couldn't work because he was making his $30 a day and all of a sudden he couldn't go to work because he couldn't see very well. He was he was getting tired and because the, the eye, um, there was like headaches and he was getting tired and he was nauseous and he couldn't go to work and he, he, wasn't, a, he wasn't able to pay whatever the other place that he was paying for. So his friends from church invited him to stay at, at their place even though there's already like seven of them there, he is number eight, sleeping on the couch. And they invite me in and they're like, oh yeah, they're, they're talking to me and I don't understand what they're saying, but it was great. <laughs> I had some coffee, I brought them some food, they were happy about it. And then I asked them to take me to, to their church to meet their um, the priest there. And they make some calls, they, they take me, uh, I, I asked to film, they, uh, the priest said it was okay, I go in. And the priest speaks really good English, so I was asking him all these questions about, because uh, I'd never heard of the Coptic church before. And I didn't realize um, what kind of situation these guys were in. Here's the situation. We're in a time of war right now, and Arab-Jewish relationships sometimes struggle, even though they're so much better this time around than in previous wars. There's some old clips from years before, from previous escalations, where you see people on the street in the... Uh, in an Arab neighborhood when the sirens blaring and there's rockets coming in from Gaza and they're all hollering and they're all, they're all cheering them on. We don't see that anymore. We didn't see that in this conflict, even though, I mean, there's some opinions out there, but it's not as blatant in Israel, in Judea, in some of the, the Palestinian cities, <clears throat> some area. Yeah, there's... That's more. That's a lot more radical. I'll tell you another story at some point about um, about that about Jewish uh, Arab relations. Anyway, these guys, the Egyptians, they're not they're Arab, but they're Christian. So the Arabs, the Muslim Arabs in in their neighborhood, don't really see them as their own, and the Jews obviously don't see them as their own because they're not Jew. And most of the time, they they don't ask to know whether you're Christian or Muslim. And if you live in a, in a Muslim neighborhood, then the assumption is you are. So these men are stuck in really, a really difficult situation. They're away from home. They haven't been home for four years, some of them. This guy, the 60-year-old, his wife, the reason he came here to begin with uh, is because his wife was diagnosed with cancer and he needed money for her treatment. So he takes the plunge. He comes here. He tries to make some money. He sends the money back to his family. All of them do. That's the reason they work here is because they're supporting families. Some of them haven't been home for four years and they have six kids relying on the money that they send back. So the guy, the 60-year-old, he left his wife and he, he's on the phone with her and she's going through chemo and he is going through his eye surgery and he's on the phone there crying. Um, and and he but he I mean he's thankful that he he got his his uh, surgery and somebody paid for it but he now has to take medication that's going to cost probably half of his salary because he doesn't have uh, medical insurance because he's an illegal and these are the stories like people can go back because once they do they'll lose this income and they may not find work over there but they have kids and families to support. Here, there's war, there's all this tension between, they're stuck in between, they're not Arab, they are Arab, but they're not Muslim, they're not Jew, they're stuck here, they're looked upon as maybe a, a threat by some. Like I said, there's, most of the time it's, it's pretty relaxed and people talk to, to anybody and there's mixed neighborhoods and there's never a, I've never felt threatened by um, just be, being in the wrong place, uh, in, in the wrong neighborhood. But stuff happens. There's crazies everywhere. On both sides, actually, Muslim and Jewish. Some crazy Christians around as well. We'll, get, we'll probably get to a story about that, that as well. Anyway, crazy life. Really difficult life situation that these people are in. There's 200 of them. 
and and nobody there's nobody that even knows about them there's nobody to help the organization uh, that i work with has has been helping because of the hospital because we got to know these people because because we got to know their situation we have uh, we've given them some support but obviously it's very difficult it's difficult because of many things there's there's internal politics you can't really give illegals help oh, are you serious my light died it took a while this light died and i had to find a cord for it spent like half an hour got sidetracked doing something else i found a <laughs> I don't know if uh, I'm going to have to cut this out probably, but I found an old camcorder, 2009 camcorder, and it's been sitting on my desk because I couldn't power it up. found a, a charger for it, charged it up, and it works. So <laughs> I'm going to play around with that, see what I can record. Where was I? These Coptic Christians, Egyptians, living in wartime in Israel, they're kind of stuck in between the cultures, Nobody helps them because the government can't help them as they're illegals. The church kind of helps, but they don't really have much money. And it's not like the, the parishioners bring any money to the church. They have work, but only until they're able to perform their, their tasks and then not. And then how do they go back? A lot of them wish they could go back, but they can't because once they do, the money runs out. And a lot of them are in a situation where they've been sending all their money back to their family so they don't have any savings they can't find they can't even buy a ticket to go back home this is one of those stories and it's not just one it's like 150 very similar stories with the same kind of hopeless future i'm not sure how to help these people but raise awareness if you want to help these people i'd love to set something up to where i can channel that help to them there's a lot of needs over there and there are very few organizations that are able to help because of all the politics and all the legal issues. But if there's an organization, like a humanitarian organization that helps refugees, migrants, um, and is able to help, we can find uh, a way to get that help to them. So there's the story, the takeaway. Your life is a lot better than theirs. Uh, there's uh, a lot we can be thankful for and there's a lot to be praying for. Uh, pray for the for the Coptic Christians in, in Israel. These are migrants. There's a lot more. I'll tell you a story about foreign workers in general. There's, there's crazy stories there that I can relay. But for now, this is what we got. Come back tomorrow. I'll tell you another one.